Hey, Adam. Yo. I'm going to say one word, and I want you to just to say whatever comes to your mind first, okay? Okay, free association. Okay, Let's free go. association. Okay, chord. Changes. Bingo. Was his name O? <laughs> Fizzbo. I'm Adam Manis. And I'm Peter Martin. And you're listening to the You'll Hear It podcast. Two pianists talk about music. We sure do. Look at our new digs here. If you're on YouTube, and if you're not, why aren't you? But if you're on YouTube, you might be seeing some new angles well, here. I can that tell we you got. why they might not be on YouTube. Because they're... Well, we actually had a comment on there. Some folks prefer... Yeah. Imagine this. Some folks prefer <laughs> to hear us and not to see us. <laughs> That's crazy talk. <laughs> well, what? No, yeah. Well, actually, no. Somebody made a comment. It was it was very astute, and I realized... I'm not a fan of Looking Peter at you and guys. Adam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, no, it was a, it was a, it was actually a really interesting comment that resonated with me because I think I feel the same way a lot of times. They said that they like to listen to the podcast, especially when we're playing musical examples, talking music, which is what we're always doing, yeah. uh, because they can really focus in on the sound, focus in on the voice, focus in on the music in a way that, of course, the visuals on on the on the YouTube gives you a whole other thing. Yeah. But it is true. There's an intimacy. There's an intimacy oh boy. to he's, my voice, right? He's caressing the mic at this point. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's a very intimate thing, and it has the ability for us to be able to focus on some of these things in a unique way. Having said that, yeah. what some folks do, and I do this with with podcasts that I enjoy, yeah. is I listen to it. Then, if I'm particularly engaged or intrigued. I will then go and consume the YouTube as well yeah. to be able to see what's happening. Yeah. And, you know, for our podcast, sometimes when you go consume the YouTube, you can see the videos that we're playing or the graphics that we're putting on screen. Uh, none for today, <laughs> but, but sometimes. Spoiler alert. Oh, wait, wait, we, we, have, we have an incredible graphic today, actually. We do. We have our new setup here. We have this enormous window, everybody, yep. in the pod front itself. You know, we call it the pod front because it's a former storefront. Yes. And so we have this huge window and we've been scared of the window yes. thus far since we moved into our new New space here open studio headquarters are live on monday oh by the way we're live 4 p.m yeah. doing q a that's right the helpline every monday jazz helpline live on on youtube yeah um but J -H -L, yeah jhl jazz helpline live i like get it. used to it i like that yeah. it rolls off the tongue that's right trippingly yeah <laughs> but big shout out to Ke uh, producer caleb for hooking all this up today because uh look at this isn't this extraordinary oh, We're look seeing... at the big beautiful window it's autumn outside now, would yeah that be something you might be interested in definitely We're able to look out at the city i mean you know there's a lot of jazz history actually right uh, well, we're hopefully making jazz history on this block, but right in this area that uh, of St. Louis, Scott Joplin House is around the corner, absolutely, where he lived and wrote Maple Leaf Rag. Ever heard of it? Um, anyway, so we're we're excited to have some um, connection with the city now. There you go. Uh, so we do have today. Speaking of getting intimate, we're going to get intimate with a, 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 a listener speakpipe. with a speak pipe. Uh, Jeff has left us a speak pipe. Yes. If you want to leave us a question, you can go to you'll hear it.com and you can leave us a voice message. Yes. And Jeff did. And this is about tackling new chord changes. All right. Hey guys, Jeff here, guitar player from Portland, Oregon. I have a question about playing over chord changes, um, specifically ones that are unfamiliar and kind of tricky. Um, how, how do you get through that? What do you do? If you're playing with people and you're playing on a tune that you don't really know and there's an area where there's just some weird changes and you don't really have vocabulary to navigate those with, what, uh, what do you do? My first instinct, I guess, would be to just try to play some good, strong rhythms and hit some chord tones and keep it pretty simple. But I was wondering if you guys had any other uh, strategies or insights. Thanks. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. So I wonder, does he mean like you're put into a situation where you're having to read something or kind of hear something and Probably. you're not familiar with it? That's it sounded I mean. like the context was you're playing with other people. Right. So there's not time to become familiar with. Right. I like not how to practice new ones, but it's all really the same. Right. Because know? I actually think the most important. Th well, first of all, number one, listen. Yeah. So what you said, Jeff, was your instinct was to play strong. Like as soon as you said play, I was thinking, uh uh. Your first inclination needs to be to not play. Yeah. Because until you you can learn, and I want to encourage you and all of us to really be able to look at the opportunity of a live performance 
to be able to learn this. Like, so you might not be able to get it by course two, but you maybe can get it by course seven yeah. or course four, wherever yeah. it is, but commit to like, don't get into the thinking of like, Oh, I don't know this. How can I just get through this? And then I'll learn it later. No, learn it on the job, learn yeah. it on the gig, totally. learn it on the tune. But in order to do that, you've got to be able to listen to start to be able to, to hear the, the core progression and it, you know, in an organic way, That's right. it's probably only one section. I think he even alluded to that. Like, so like if you have a, just a difficult little section of a tune where right. it's like a unfamiliar, but you got to have a little bit of perspective of like, once you hear it, so maybe play the part that you are able to get through. And then the tricky part, just lay out. Yeah. You know what I mean? You can. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes that's, that's the best choice. Yeah. yeah. Because you're going to be able to learn it or at least familiarize yourself with it and start to be able to jump in maybe on the next course or the next time around yeah. with a little more confidence. If you've not played, like as soon as you start messing it up, your confidence is going to go down. That's your right. ability to be able to hear it and navigate it is going to go down. That's right. And it becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? That's right. So don't be afraid to lay out and then just come in the next time around with what you think you can handle mm -hmm. and then keep listening. That's Keep right. listening to what's happening around you and then come in with like a little bit more. But listening is key. Listening yeah. first always. But yeah. I do think, Jeff, your your instinct to go strong in on rhythm when you do play, when yeah. you do come back in, yeah. to have strong rhythm and chord tones. I think those two things are, that would be your foot in the door for this for sure. Like, you know, Barry Harris is someone that you can go to on how to approach this and actually Peter Martin. So whatever the chord is, you have one, three, five, seven, three, five, seven, nine, right? You yeah. have those, usually you have those things, arpeggio. right? Like, or, you know, you could have just a regular triad arpeggio if it's a G minor chord and it's like a series of chords that are weird. Just the root arpeggio can get you halfway there. Then Barry Harris might suggest the arpeggio from the fifth you know whatever that is will get you will get you even some more pretty tones but yeah. those kinds of things are super simple things you can do and then i always think you know when i'm going through some weird chord progressions i'm also trying to hear i'm trying to hear melodies straight away but to do that i think i'm trying to hear like the common tones between what's happening yes. right to hear because usually if it's a weird you know <laughs> There's something that the composer has to latch yeah. onto. It's usually not Some just like force. all like, like random stuff thrown yeah. at you, right? It usually has something melodic happening that you can latch onto. I'm trying to hear that. And then that brings me to my final point, which is what's the melody do? Yeah. You know, if you, if you know the melody of the tune, you have something to play. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then you can start to be able to hear how that tricky part of the progression interacts with or lays under the yeah. melody yeah. and the melody. Yeah. Melody and rhythm are usually going to be kind of easier to n hear and navigate possibly before some tricky progressions. Um, but yeah, that all that stuff is important. And if you kind of think about maybe the, the unifying factor with all those is, you're looking for patterns. That's right. You're listening for patterns. That's why we say, like, it's a lot easier to be able to identify a pattern by listening to it than by trying to hear it while you're playing it. Yeah. Because if you don't, if you don't play it correctly, which you probably aren't, if it's tricky the first time, that's going to be kind of canceling out or clashing with what the actual progression is. So if you can lay back and try to identify quickly, as quickly as possible, and this is why ear training is so important. Super always, important. Um, but you want to identify kind of what some of those harmonic harmonic patterns are and then try to sort of build up as simply as possibly, which typically is going to be from like a shell and maybe root and shell, mm -hmm. maybe root shell pretty um, as you navigate through those chords, those tricky chords, as opposed to trying try to play full blown voicings. Over so them. what Peter's talking about there is just, you know, the shell, the third and the seventh, right? Okay. Guide tones, some people call this so that you can. You can he kind of hear that harmonic outline. Yep. You could also use this melodically too. Yep. Yep. Throw, throw some solid rhythm in there. You know, yep. then you've got something outside the melody. But that what I was just playing was countdown is a perfect example of if you know the melody, then you have something interesting to play. Absolutely. Over those weird changes. Yeah. And one more thing I'll throw in there is, you know, with any kind of a quandary that we find ourselves in, which you will find yourself, which a quandary. You, you should hope to find yourself in because that is what's going to lead to musical growth. If it requires ear training, technical challenges, um, vocabulary development, repertoire, whatever. Yeah. Like whenever you're thrown into a situation where you can't do something like smile, 
and be happy hey, because you're about to yeah. have a smile is just a frown turned upside That's down. That's all it is, right? buddy. Yeah. A friend is just an enemy, a frenemy that you haven't yeah. met yet. Um, no, but you want to be able to, you, you want to lean into that as a learning opportunity, but you also want to be thinking about what is the promised land? What does it look like, like being able to really do this well? So if you think about that, navigating the changes, what does that actually mean? Does it mean that you're conscious of every single chord as it goes by? Probably not. It just means that you can play, like paint it done, as yeah. you like to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, what is success look like for this? That means you kind of ripping through, either playing the chords, you know. Yeah, yeah. Don't do that, by the way. Don't do that. That's all the chords to, to Giant Steps played kind of without time, right? Yeah, yeah. But that's just the succession of them. But like... Being able to know those chord changes, what it actually looks like is not thinking about it. That's right. So you have to put that as part of your plan and part of your aspiration, part of your mountaintop that you want to get to. So that's why hearing it, building up for these simple things, pattern recogni recognition, and being able to you know, kind of learn to navigate as quickly as possible, challenge yourself, jump in as you're starting to hear it. Um, are really just, part of what the game is. Don't don't lean into the theoretical side. I just want to plant a flag in that thinking about it and come back to it yeah. for just a second. But my last thing on this, Jeff, and this is just this is crucial advice for any any playing. I mean, just play the right notes. Just play the right notes. How hard is that? That's right. Anyway, no, I, I, I wanted to, I wanted to plant a flag into your. You don't want to think about it because we. I had a comment the other day. Yeah, we, we get comments sometimes yes. on the things we do because I made. Please this, comment below on the YouTube. Yeah, comment sure. below on the YouTube. Well, I, I made this YouTube video called Cookie Cutter Chords about yes. these different voicings, right? And someone was like, and the whole idea was like, oh, you Wait, could... I thought it was called sugar cookie chords. Oh my Is that gosh. something? No, 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 <laughs> it's called avocado articulations. Avocado toast articulations. Uh, <laughs> but this guy commented like, because uh, the whole point of the video is like, oh yeah, you can use these so you don't have to think as much. And he's like, oh yeah, let's not think. Let's <laughs> nobody think, world's getting better. Let's not, yeah, just like, no, let's do. Do you think when you play? Are you thinking when you're Because if you're thinking when you're playing, you're dead in the water. Right. I don't want to be thinking. Like, right. I, I want cookie cutter stuff that I can, you know, it's not not cookie cutter in the sense of like, oh, this I'll just throw this generic stuff that means nothing to me, yeah. not plastic. I mean, like, I need things that I don't have to spend a lot of mental energy doing because so I can be free to make the art I want to make. Yes. You know, it's, these are all colors and tools that we use. We don't want to be like trying to spell out a chord voice thing as we're trying to play it. Right. You know, it's just got to be there. I think people get confused with don't think about something with don't pay attention to don't concentrate. We're, we're not, pre we're preaching for concentration, for listening, for yeah. monitoring, being in the moment, knowing what, from our creativity, the moment needs as best that we can provide that's that. Right. But that's very different than thinking about, overthinking, theorizing as you're playing. That's what we're saying we don't want to be doing. At we all. want to be free in the moment to create, to tell our story. That's right. That's a high level of concentration. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that's something that I think people, and I think a lot of times folks think that we're like, oh, well, that's easy for you guys because you know all this stuff. First of all, we don't know all this stuff. I, I know for me, like the amount that I'm still learning is very exciting because it, the better that I feel like I'm getting, the more that I see to be able to learn. So it's like, oh, great. I, I love that because there's just more challenges to go. Yeah. I feel secure with kind of where I'm at, but I also see like, oh, I'm excited because I still want to develop. It's not like I've cracked the code for this. But having said that, there's still times when I'm playing where the thinking process does get a little screwed up. So this is not like you just flip a switch at some point and it's like, oh, you're a master, you don't have to think. Yeah, sometimes I'm like, I do have to go into the theory or whatever, but that's a reminder to me is like, okay, I gotta really nail and learn that progression. I need to really learn that I got to shed on this or whatever, because that's always the aspiration Right, is the total freedom. So that you don't have to do that on the gig. Exactly. Because then you're, you're gone. You're yeah, done. You yeah. Can't, and you can't I'll bring really up, you know, a big inspiration to me that I love bringing applications into making music in terms of performance, uh, but training or what we would call, you know, in athletics, typically we we're talking about training, especially endurance athletics, very much a corollary with perf uh, practicing for performing. So Eli Kipchoge, who, who's a, uh, yeah, just broke the world record again. Greatest ever, maybe? Oh, yeah. He's the great. Yeah. You know, he, when you have the world records, it's a little easier. Like, we don't have to do the seven. I, I mean, know. you can do the seven best. This, but this it's kind of like, seven isn't the times. person who ran the marathon the fastest pretty much number one? Yeah, um, and he broke his own record. But 
the thing was his train, like he's known for precision training. He's also an incredible competitor. So he never really gives up and lets a lot of cameras in on the training process. They see some of it. Yeah. A lot of people now know, and he does talk about it. But, but my point is that as perfect as his training was for, to an outsider would see it as he broke that record by 30 seconds, which is a lot, but he actually made, and even it kind of admitted to some errors during the race, the equivalent of to like overthinking or underthinking. He ran the first half, too fast he uh did what's called a uh, positive split which has actually never been a, a world record broken with a positive split. where the first half is, is faster. faster than the second half oh. which is very hard to do successfully and so he was kind of a lot a lot of people like if he had as incredible as the race was had he done a negative split yeah. and held back just a little bit he still broke the record but it's just to say that even when you're at the most elite level the, the world-class level there's not going to be the perfection there in telling your story and executing which is okay yeah you know you have that margin for error and that's where the fun and the humanity absolutely of the performance comes in absolutely yeah. and hey if you want to go on a deeper dive of any of, any of this kind of stuff if you want to train these uh sounds into your into your body so that you don't have to think about it as you're doing it. Uh, we've got a course for that. Did you know that? I, this should be our new it's slogan. Open Studio Pro. No, well, no, yeah. it's actually called Jazz Scales for Beginners, oh, where we actually scale, deal right. with exactly this stuff. Like, you yeah. got to change. What do I play on the change? And it's not just playing scales. It's like how to use like chord tones and things like that. So you actually, could, you know what? I think Jazz Scale for Beginners is a great. Any folks that have been thinking or tinkering with the idea of entering the open studio world, jumping in the pool, it's a good come, starting off point. Come, yeah, come on in. Yeah. And it's a great place, and I think it's a great um, introduction to your teaching styles, kind of the open studio way, and that if folks want to really make that that commitment, especially like at the turn of the new year, I'm thinking to Open Studio Pro. Like if you like jazz scales for beginners, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're and, and you're really to, you got some time to really commit to everyday practice. You're gonna like it. Then Open Studio Pro would be your next point of departure. We will link to the free lesson to jazz scales at the beginners so that you can sample it if you want. Sounds good. Till next time. You'll hear it.